One of the bright spots of the Hot Zone project for me was covering the tiny mountainous nation of Nepal. I was inspired by the determination of its citizens and their courageous people's movement. They had endured a decade-long civil war between their autocratic king, who dissolved the parliament, and the Communist Party of Nepal Maoist. Its rebel army waged a bloody insurgency against the monarchy, resulting in 13,000 deaths and countless human rights atrocities by both sides. Many of the Nepalese were caught in the middle, disagreeing both with the Maoist rebels and their king, who became even more autocratic. A month before I arrived in Nepal, 21 people were killed and hundreds were injured by the king's police in pro-democracy demonstrations. But the people had spoken, the king ceded his powers, and the transformation to democracy had begun. How are you sure this won't be reversed, that the king won't play back? The day I'm here, it's peaceful. It feels like a nation on the threshold of democracy. Also, there are signs that the Maoists have been accepted back into the fold, like Maoist political prisoners from around the country being released from jail. But peace isn't guaranteed yet. There's a wild card, the 20,000 strong Maoist rebel army. I arrange a secret meeting and ride with the Maoists to see one of their rebel brigades near the border with India. But in a strange turn, we pass by the very enemy they've sworn to defeat, columns of Nepalese army soldiers. Eventually, we arrive at an open field. On cue, the rebels begin to stream out of the surrounding woods. Some are armed, some are not. Some have uniforms, others only civilian clothes. They seem young to me and not very intimidating. Yet these rebels have a reputation for ruthlessness. Much of the force is made up of women. The Maoists say they're among the fiercest fighters and make up a third of the entire army. Within the group, I see a girl who calls herself Janaki. She's only 16, tiny and with an innocent face. But she carries a compact submachine gun on her shoulder. Is she afraid sometimes? No, I'm not afraid. The rebels I know have come here only for me. Though political winds have shifted in their favor, they want to show the world they can still fight if they have to. They perform a series of drills, then as quickly as they arrived, they disappear back into the woods ready to be called out again when they're needed. Being here at sunset on Dal Lake, watching the boatmen pulling their shikaras across the water. It seems almost impossible to me that a shot has ever been fired in anger here. But the truth is, this northwest area of the Indian subcontinent has been in conflict since 1947. India has fought three wars with Pakistan and one with China over the control of Kashmir. And now the area is divided between the three, with India occupying more than half the region. An anti-Indian Muslim insurgency sprang up in the Indian-occupied portion in 1989 and there's been a steady stream of killings and human rights abuses by both the insurgent groups and Indian security forces ever since. Today, Kashmir is one of the most heavily armed places on the planet, with an estimated half a million Indian security forces deployed here. Unfortunately, it's no guarantee of peace, especially this week, while the Indian Prime Minister is visiting for peace talks. This is the third attack today, though. Do you fear that there's going to be these kind of attacks all week long? But there is another attack. Someone threw a grenade on a bus full of Indian tourists. We raced to the hospital to talk to the survivors and to see the bodies of the dead, two young boys and two teenage girls. Everybody was thinking what happened, what happened. Himant Zarawala sits in the lobby of the hospital, his shirt and his jeans covered in the blood of his son whose body lies on the stainless steel gurney in the hospital's morgue. I told him not to sit in the front, come in the back and sit with me. He told no, I will, I will go in the front. Vipin Bai, another tourist on the bus, describes the scene to reporters when the mother of one of the dead children finds him and throws her arms around his neck.
It's hard to keep my camera pointing at them, their spectacle of grief, but it's also hard not to. I want others to see what I see, the real face of war, not soldiers in helmets and body armor, but the unprotected flesh of civilians. Oh, 